New Japan Pro Wrestling just had their second biggest show of the year, Dominion, just a few hours ago, and whew, we're going to talk about that in a second. And I know what you're about to say, but I thought you stopped watching New Japan nine months ago. What happened? What happened? What happened? Easy. That was my opinion nine months ago. Yesterday, I was looking at the New Japan Pro Wrestling Dominion match card, and I said, this match card actually looks really good. A lot of great talent on there, newer talent, fresh matchups, and young lions that I watched in 2018 grow up and flourish into full-fledged wrestlers are now back on the show in major roles. So fuck me for wanting to give New Japan a chance again. If you guys don't recall, back in 2018, I used to review New Japan Pro Wrestling all the time. I mean, like, every show. In 2018 to 2020, I was known as the New Japan guy on Twitter, Reddit, and, like, YouTube. To make a long story short, in August of 2020, New Japan Pro Wrestling's broadcast company, TV Asahi, copyright struck 17 of my videos. Straight up got my channel deleted at one point. And as you can see, the channel is back. Because I spent months fighting with TV Asahi and Google to get it back. And that deterred me from talking about New Japan for a long time. Not only was the show great, but I enjoyed it. And it's newsworthy. So now we're going to talk about it. Just a disclaimer, I will be altering some of the images you see. Because a big part of the reason why I got copyright struck in the first place was using their imagery. Which falls under US law fair use, but apparently in Japan they don't give a fuck about it. So I will use their imagery during spurts because that's the US law and I'm allowed to. But I'll also alter it because I want to fall within fair use. That being said, TV Asahi, if you want to try that bullshit on me again, umaiwa kukuso soruzo. I hope I said that right. Now then, let's get into the review. I took notes. I'm pretty proud of myself. I never take notes, but for this show, I say we're going to try something different. Will Ospreay versus Lance Archer was the first match to open up this show. For those of you not in tune, there was a tournament happening to determine who will face Kenny Omega at Forbidden Door. Getting into the finals, I thought it was a fine opener. They've had matches in the past, and they normally always bang out. Like, honestly and truly, if you ask me what are my top three favorite Lance Archer matches, two of them feature Will Ospreay. They just have that great David and Goliath chemistry. And this was no different. It wasn't as great as the other two matches, but it did fire on all cylinders. Osprey started off hot, he was doing moonsaults and flips and whatnot, and I was actually kind of shocked. And let me not over-exacerbate, he wasn't doing like flips the whole match, it was just literally in the beginning. But he's a heavyweight now, and he doesn't really do this very often. But whenever he does, it kind of pops me a little bit. And Archer was his powerhouse self. When he was supposed to get agile, he did. We got a fine opener because of it. Osprey hit four hidden blades back to back to back to back in order to beat Lance Archer and get the win. And he is now confirmed to face Kenny Omega for the IWGP United States Championship at Forbidden Door. And I'm gonna beat her live to see that shit, let's fucking go! I'm gonna give Osprey versus Archer a solid 3 out of 5. Nothing I'd recommend, but not something I'd tell you to skip either. We had an 8 man tag between Taichi, Doki, Yoshinobu, Kanimaru, and Takami Shinoku of Just 5 Guys versus Teton, Bushi, Shingo Takage, and Tetsuya Naito of Los Ingo Bernables de Hapo. This was your typical 8 man New Japan tag team match. If you watch any New Japan Pro Wrestling Road 2 show, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Literally nothing crazy happened, and it was more so to build more anticipation for the main event, which is LIJ versus Just 5 Guys. Teton got the win for LIJ by submitting Taka Mishinoku, who I was very excited to see back in New Japan. I haven't watched in a long time, so he might have came back months ago. I haven't seen Taka in a New Japan Pro Wrestling ring in like years, so that's always cool. I'm gonna give this match two and three quarters out of five. It's not a bad match, but you can skip it. We also had Kevin Knight and Kushida defending the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Championships against TJP and Francesco Akira of the United Empire. I already know. There's a black man in Japan, so I was hot. Before I stopped watching New Japan Pro Wrestling, Kevin Knight was a young lion that I had my eye on for very obvious reasons. And he showed a lot of promise in general. To see him now in a tag team with Kushida as a tag team champion warms my heart so much. And he delivered in his tag match too. I mean, everybody did, but Kevin Knight showed out. If there's two prodigies that come out of this thing, it's Kevin Knight and Francesco Akira. Now, Francesco Akira got introduced into New Japan, I believe, last year. He made a very impressive mark in Best of the Super Juniors. I've had my eye on that guy ever since. He and TJP together have really good tag team chemistry, as did Kushida and Kevin Knight. There was a lot of fast-paced action, as you would guess from the juniors. Sleek transitions, counters, and tag team moves. And ultimately, United Empire ended up regaining the tag team titles with Francesco Akira pinning Kevin Knight. After the match, Dan Maloney and Clark Connors of Bullet Club now came out to attack the champions. I'm not familiar with Dan Maloney, but Clark Connors was always good as a young lion. Just not excited about him being a part of the Bullet Club. I'll explain why later. But I give this three and a quarter out of five stars. Not a must see, but don't skip it. We had Zack Sabre Jr. defending the New Japan Pro Wrestling World Television title against Jeff Cobb. 
If there's anything I love about the world television title, is the sense of urgency that comes with these title matches. With these matches having a 15 minute time limit, all of that opening sequence, you know, the 30, 45 minute epics, that plunder that happens in the first 20, 15 minutes is cut out. Just get straight to the action. And I love the fast contrasting styles of Jeff Cobb's powerhouse and Zack Sabre Jr.'s technical wrestling. It made for really captivating television. In the end, Zack Sabre Jr. reversed the tour of the islands into a crucifix pin in order to get the win and retain the television title. I believe commentary said this is Zack's 11th defense. And if these are all those matches, keep them coming. I'll have to watch his match with Alex Coughlin on ROH, because I'm sure that banged out too. I'd also give this match 3 and a quarter out of 5 stars. Not too crazy, but don't skip it. Hiroko Goto and Yoshihashi versus Evil Yujiro Takahashi versus Aaron Hanare and the Great Okan for the IWGP and New Japan Strong Tag Team Championships. Whenever I see Evil in a match, the first instinct I have is to turn it off. But then I saw Yoshihashi and Hiroki Goto and I'm like, I like these guys, they can pull something out of Evil. And Yujiro. The Great Okan and Aaron Hanare, they're alright. I don't watch their matches enough to form an opinion. So don't take it as like me hating on them, I just, I just can't speak much about them. But this match? was better than it had any right to be. Triangle tag team matches can be very hectic, especially if there's like no stipulation attached. But this was well balanced. Everybody got their chance to shine. It was just really damn good. Lightning near falls to keep you locked in. As you would guess, there was fucking interference from Bullet Club and from United Empire. But Yo came out to save the day with a skateboard in his hand. I thought it was Darby Allen for a second. Maybe Yo and Darby are forbidden door, who knows. So much interference, yet so much action. Yoshihashi ended up pinning Takahashi to become the new tag team champions with Goto. After the match, Gabriel Kidd and Alex Coughlin came out in Bullet Club shirts and beat down everybody. So now, basically, we have the whole entire last class of the Young Lions in Bullet Club. I love it and I hate it. I say love and hate because, A, young lions are getting more limelight. And I hate it because when you go to the Bullet Club, your moveset gets shot down. They water it down and soil it with interferences. So many Bullet Club or House of Torture matches are muddied with interference. So much so it ruins them. Hopefully they calm it down. But that's hopeful thinking. I'm gonna give this match 4 out of 5. It's a near great tag team match that I think you should check out if you have time. David Finley defended his never open way championship against El Fantasmo. Now I haven't watched New Japan in a hot minute, so when I saw ELPP come out with a new theme song and as a heavyweight, bruh, I was so happy for him. I always thought El Fantasma was very talented. But again, being in a Bullet Club restricts you so much. And mind you, I would say he was the most profound and brightest personality in Bullet Club. Whenever he wrestled, it was entertaining. Or really damn good. Now we get to see him do more because he's not restricted by just interferences or you can't do flashy moves because you're a heat. That whole stick. Handcuffs are off. Let's see what he can do. And honestly, I thought this was good. In spurts. It's far from the best match on the card. And honestly, it's another case where Bullet Club interferences and Bullet Club shenanigans just muddied the match. Now, nobody interfered during the match, but I watched David Finley wrestle in New Japan before. And watching him wrestle here, you can tell he was holding back some. Then there was a table spot on the outside, which was fine, but you know, cheating. Outside of that, the offense and defense from El Fantasma was really good. He was flying all over the place to start off the match. And of course, the dialogue between himself and David Finley during this match was funny as well. LPP sadly did not get the win. It was David Finley powerbombing him outside the ring through that table, putting him back inside of the ring, and then hitting Oblivion to get the win. I should also mention during David Finley's entrance, Gabriel Kidd, Alex Coughlin, Clark Connors, and Dan Maloney all came out beside him. And they were there at the end when he retained. Bullet Club is stronger than ever with all these newer guys in it. It's almost like a completely different faction, honestly. With all these former Young Lions and David Finley at the helm leading all of it. I'm interested to see where it goes, but my expectations and my hopes are very low. Because it's New Japan booking the Bullet Club, and we all know how this ends. I'm gonna give this match three and a quarter out of five stars. It was plotting at points, and honestly, if you would have cut five minutes out of it, it would have been a better match. But it was still good nonetheless. Hiromu Takahashi defended the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship against the best of the Super Juniors 2023 winner, Master Wado. I was happy as can be to see that Master Wado won best of the Super Juniors. Even though I was rooting for Speedball Mike Bailey to win, Master Wado was my second choice. It was on the very show that I got a bunch of copyright strikes from New Japan Pro Wrestling Dominion 2020 that Master Wado made his debut as the fully developed character. But I wouldn't even say it was fully, dare I even say fully developed, because everybody knows that Master Wado in 2020 was a bit rough around the edges. But in these three years, he's done a whole 180, and I feel like now he is ready to take on the world. 
He and Hiromu Takahashi had a great match. Master Wado's Lucha Retsu background coming into this match was just amazing with Hiromu Takahashi's New Japan Pro Wrestling main event style while at the same time having his own uniqueness to it. If you watch a Hiromu Takahashi match and a main event Takahashi match, you know what I mean. It's not your Okada main event or your Tanahashi main event. It's, it's, it's unique. It still has that 15 minutes of, you know, plotting and setting up. But when you get down to the nitty gritty, it's... There was one part in this match that I really loved. Hiromu took Master Wado up the ramp and suplexed him. He went onto the apron, sat there, and waited. Master Wado kind of took a page out of Takahashi's lunacy book, and he rolled down the ramp to give himself momentum to get back up. Hiromu laughed the whole way through. It was a small little touch and a small little detail, but I loved it. Master Wado trying to play Hiromu's game. He didn't win at it, unfortunately. Hiromu Takahashi hit a time bomb, a burning lariat, and then his time bomb plunger to get the win and retain the Junior Heavyweight Championship. Now, I believe Master Wado should have won this match. The man's been there for three years, busting his ass, and he won the BOS check. A tournament that Tanahashi, a tournament that Takahashi himself won two years prior, back to back. Takahashi is the junior ace and has been for like five years, at least six years. He has far exceeded this division. He's faced everybody. He's beaten everybody. I love him to death. He will always be one of my favorites in New Japan, but there's like no reason for him to even be champion right now, let alone still be the ace of this division. Hiromu should have been called up to the heavyweight scene. It's to the point where even though he's my favorite, whenever I see him face off against another wrestler for the championship, I'm always rooting against him because it's so unnecessary for him to be the champion. He's basically booked like Okada is, except he's a junior. Master Wado should have won, but despite all that, I'm going to give this match four and a half out of five. It's a great showcase of junior action that I recommend you guys check out. The co-main event saw Tomohiro Ishii, Hiroshi Tanahashi, and Kazuchika Okada defend their never six openweight tag team championships against Blackpool Combat Clubs, Claudio Castagnoli and John Moxley, and Roughneck Shota Umino. Now for those of you who've been here for a very long time, and I mean back when I reviewed New Japan, you knew that I used to call Shota Umino my son. Because I had such high hopes for that kid from the very first time I saw him, the very last time I saw him in New Japan. I knew he was going to be something big. And now here he is, feuding with Okada. A tear almost fell to my eye during this match. <laughs> also, he had this weird but also really cool mentorship with John Moxley. Anytime they team up with each other, it's it's just this very euphoric feeling. It feels so right. We got to see it here. And man, let me tell you, this match kicked so much ass. This was easily the best match on the entire show. Everybody got their chance to shine. We saw every iteration you could imagine. Okada Umino had their own little story. That got a lot of the shine. We saw Moxley and Okada go at it. We saw Moxley and Ishii, who had a great match in G1 Climax 29, go at it again. We saw Tanahashi and Umino, which is like Ace versus Future Ace. And Umino models himself almost nearly like Tanahashi does in looks appearances. So this made so much sense. You saw Claudio versus everybody, especially Claudio versus Ish. That, oh my god, that is a G1 match waiting to happen. So many stories in just one match. And when New Japan wants to, they can dish out some bomb-ass six-man tags. This was one of them. You had the story of Umino going after Okada, trying to go for that ace position. Okada not really taking him seriously while at the same time trying to disrespect him. Knock him down a peg and show him who's really boss. Kind of like his feud with Kaito in the very beginning of the year. Claudio doing the swing on Okada was just such a sight to see. Seeing Claudio in New Japan was just so awesome. And then to top it all off, Umino, Moxley, and Claudio did the shield powerbomb onto Okada. I marked the hell out. The climax of the match saw Okada hit the Raymaker onto Umino to get the win. Sadly, Umino did not get the win in this match, and he got pinned. But it's okay, because he's going to get that win in G1 Climax. This was simply a bombastic tag team match. One of the best six-man tags I've seen all year. The match gets four and three quarters out of five stars. Near perfection, definitely check it out. After the match, Moxley hopped on the mic and said, Okada, you want a challenge? Here's your damn challenge. We got a promo package from Brian Danielson, who proceeded to challenge Okada to a match at Forbidden Door, which Okada accepted. Osprey and Omega 2, Danielson versus Okada? Let's fuck it. And finally, we had our main event, the IWGP World Heavyweight Champion Sonata versus challenger Yoda Suji. Now, Yoda Suji just recently came back from Excursion, and like right away is thrusted right into this title scene. He joined LIJ, like it, it's crazy. And I mean, they were heavy on this match, talking about the Raymaker Shock 10 years ago, Okada beating Tanahashi, and it skyrocketed him to the 8th position. 
mentioning Evil coming in and beating Tetsuya Naito unexpectedly for the World Heavyweight Championship three years ago. They wanted you to believe that Yoda Suji was going to pull the upset of a lifetime. And they had that crowd believing because, bro, the crowd was firmly behind Yoda Suji. And I myself was firmly behind Yoda Suji. And I'm not trying to say the crowd was booing Sonata or nothing, but like, it was 90% Yoda Suji. And I was rooting for Yoda because that 2019 Young Lion class consisted of Yoda Suji and Yuya Yamura. And I fell in love with those two as well. So I really wanted Yoda to win this match. And when this match started and this man hit a spear like two minutes in, and then followed that with a fucking spaceman plancha, I said, we, we off. Go. Go. He was hitting super kicks and dives. He was, he was dusting Sonata for a second. I said, hold on a minute. Who's the in here. Yoda Suji impressed the hell out of me in this match. Sonata was also there too. Let me stop playing. He was good too. But Yoda Suji was on it. I mean, I figured he was going to be that guy when the match first started and he went up to LIJ and he did this. He went to do the little LIJ fist bump in front of Sonata, a former LIJ member. I said, oh, he on this type of time. All right. And then later in the match, Sonata hits his finisher right and this motherfucker had the nerve to cartwheel out of that bitch. Hit a fire ass striking combo. And a goddamn curb stomp. I said, oh, you that nigga for real. Let's fucking go. Then Sonata finally woke up and said, <coughs> no, you're not. Counter Yoda Suji Spear with a drop kick. Hit a moonsault, a shining wizard, and his finishing move to get the win. And bro, that crowd died when Sonata got the three count. I kid you not, the entire arena went silent on that last count. This crowd really badly wanted to see Yoda Suji win. Now, I think truly, I feel like Yoda Suji should have won this match. We we're already talking it up like he could do it. Might as well follow through with it. Despite the flat finish, I'm going to give this match four and a half out of five stars. The energy was palpable. The action was exciting. A tremendous debut despite him losing. Above all else, it wasn't your typical New Japan main event. Opened hot and flowed throughout. Honestly, Dominion was a great show. Go check it out. I'll talk about the G1 in a separate video.